You know, as I got older, um, I believe that the enemy had traps, set up traps for me. Yeah. Uh, um, and once I entered into middle school is where the traps begin, where Satan began to uh, attack me using people. I felt my heartbeat slow down, go boom, 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 boom. And I tell my friend, honey, I feel like I'm about to pass out. Like I'm like, I'm going to die. Before I even said that, I dropped, I collapsed. I don't even know what happened. All I know is the next day I woke up, I was in the hospital. I had all sorts of like IVs on me. And the doctor comes in and says, young lady, uh, you're one lucky girl to be alive. He said, uh, you overdosed last night. Did you know what was in, in that weed? I see him with a gun in his hand. And, and then he comes over and he shakes me. He's like, Andrea, wake up. And he goes, he puts the gun on my head and he goes, Andrea, if you ever leave me, I'm going to kill you. He said, I'm going to kill you just like that. And I, and I began to pray in my head, I said, Lord, help me. Hey, welcome to our podcast. Today we have the privilege of hearing from Andrea Huartes, whose life story is a powerful testament to transformation and redemption. From navigating the shadows of occultism and the world of exotic dancing to experiencing a miraculous spiritual awakening, Andrea's journey is truly remarkable. Born into a Christian household, Andrea's path took a turn when she was introduced to witchcraft during her school years. This led her down to a perilous road of demonic torment, substance abuse, violence, and eventually a career in the strip club industry. However, it was during a time of incarceration that Andrea experienced a profound encounter with God, sparking a transformative journey from darkness to light. Well, today, Andrea serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration, using her experiences to empower others facing similar struggles. As a passionate worship leader and a vocal coach, she channels her gifts to glorify Jesus and guide others towards salvation through faith. Andrea, I want to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Cindy. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here. Thank you. <laughs> well, like I said, you, your story is, is a powerful testament to transformation and redemption. And I think I shared this with you, um, you know, when we initially spoke. Um, I said, you know, hearing when I was watching you giving that testimony, um, I had all sort of emotions going on, you know. Um, I had tears running down my eyes. You had me shouting, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you know, and there was, you know, some moments were hard to watch, you know, yeah. well, enough about me. I do want to open up the floor to you and just, you know, begin sharing where, wherever you want to start. Oh my goodness. I just want to thank you, Cindy, so much for having me. What an honor it is to be on your platform and just for believing in my testimony. And I really, truly believe that the Holy Spirit, God, is opening doors to allow this story to be spread around the world of his power, of how God is still in the saving business. He is Amen. more alive than ever. So, right. you know... He is a living God. He is a real God. He is a God of miracles, wonders, and he is still saving today. So uh, glory yeah. to God. I give him all the honor and all the glory. So, uh, yes, amen. 
So uh, my parents migrated from Bogota, Colombia, South America, to Washington, D.C., um, and then they moved to Maryland, and they had uh, two girls, which I was one of them, and my sister, and we grew up in the Silver Spring area here in Maryland, uh, and from very, very little, I remember going to church. I remember my parents were very devoted Christians. Um I, I always remember in our household, we would have the Bible and illustration books of, of Jesus and Moses and all the, the Bible stories. And uh, I would always look at the images and point, Dad, who is this? And you know, it was very curious, you know, and, and what is Jesus saying to the little kids? And I mean, we had these cool, very uh, colorful illustration books, and it, it was just so, so beautiful and such so innocent as a child, you know, and I remember being dropped off. My parents had dropped me off in the children's ministry and we would do arts and crafts and um, we would sing. And that was my favorite part as a child singing. And I'd be like, oh, my goodness, you know, and I would sing along and um, they would they would play music, the guitar. And my dad was also a uh, worship leader, a, um, a singer at, at church. So I believe that this was where uh, music evolved in my life, as yeah. most of my family were worshipers and, and singers and musicians. So, and my mother always just so devoted uh, housewife, um, always taking care of my sister and I and making sure that we had the most beautiful outfits to go to church. And she would always have these like shiny little black and white shoes with the hats and so cute, you know, so just the innocence, you know, it, it, it was so beautiful and just around Christian friends and family. And, you know, as I got older, um, I believe that the enemy had traps, set up traps for me. Yeah. Uh, um, and once I entered into middle school is where the traps began, where Satan began to uh, attack me using people. And yeah. one of them was I was in social studies class in a classroom and there was a boy who sat next to me and the kid was very different. Yes. He dressed very differently. He dressed pretty dark, all black, and he had a cultic jewelry and a lot of the kids bullied him and it bothered me. And, you know, I stood quiet, but then one day I stood, I stood up for him and I said, Hey, leave him alone. You know, I'm tired of you guys bullying him. And he saw that. And I think that he became closer to me because of it. And he began to trust me and we became very close uh, friends in the classroom. We had, a, you know, we could talk a lot and he started um, talking to me about his family, about his home, about his hobbies. And then once he got very comfortable, the conversations began to be dark, um, mm -hmm. you know, about certain things that he was doing. And I was, I didn't know what he was talking about, but then he confessed to me that he was a practicing warlock, a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. He was doing spells. He was um, doing astral projection. Um, he was opening up his third eye. All these things I'd never heard of in my household. So this was very new to me. And mm -hmm. I became curious. And I started asking him more questions. And because of that, he was bringing in all his books that he had at home. And he said, hey, here, keep the books and, you know, learn about it, read about it. And I remember he gave me a book. It was the Satanic Bible from Anton LaVey, one of the darkest books. And I remember putting it in my backpack and I went home and I started reading these books. And there was a moment that I felt every time I opened the books, it was fear. It was just like fear suddenly and more of a curiosity, more of almost like an obsession to know more because I felt that, you know, when you're never taught about this, it's like you want to, you want to know more. Well, why, why is it my parents never told me about this? No one was ever talking about this. All I knew of was Jesus and I never knew about the dark side and the spells and, and there's captain, you know, and, and I said, what's going on here? I never confronted my parents about it, but I knew that it was bad because I felt fear. And it's like when you're in sin, 
and it's for the moment it feels good, but then you know that it's bad, right? Yes. And, and 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 I kept doing that. I knew it was bad, and I knew I had to hide hide them. And mm -hmm. so I kept reading these books. He kept like telling me specific things about each of the books. Um, wow. And it, it, yeah, it, it was it was very dark. And so what happened was one day during lunchtime, this boy brings in a cardboard Ouija board. I didn't know what that was. He said that it was a, it's called a spirit board and you can talk to the dead. You can talk to spirits. You can talk to, um, you know, another dimension and you can, uh, you know, see your future and all these things. Right. And so I was like, this is so weird. Really? No, I don't believe it. And he had a pencil, but this is not the real board. And then he says, you know, the real board is in Toys R Us. And then Toys R Us was a very popular toy store in like the 80s, 90s. And at, at that time, my sister and I, uh, we had the latest board games, Connect Four, Twister, Hungry Hippo. I mean, all every latest game we had, we had all the collections of all the games. My parents oh spoiled us and gave us the best games. And so I told my parents, I said, Mom, Dad, there's this new game that's out. Do you think I can have it? And they're like, yeah, sure. So, you know, innocently, my parents took us to the toy store. And this toy, the Ouija board was in the toy section in the children's section. Hmm. So imagine, you know, it, it, they didn't think anything. Then it, it, it seemed more innocent. They bought me this game. I brought it home. And I remember my sister didn't want to play with it. And our board games, usually you play with more than one player. You play two, two players or more, right? So my sister was the only one that I could play the game with. And so she's like, no, my sister, I don't know. I don't like that game. That game doesn't, doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. And at that time, I'm like, really? I, I didn't. I said, you know what? She's my youngest sister. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So I decided to invite some friends. I said, hey, guys, you know, I got this new game. Do you guys want to come and play? Yeah, sure. They come over. We play with it. And, you know, we all begin to blame each other of who's who's moving the planchet, who's moving the the little part that moves. That's and right. so I, was, I, I kept having my doubts, but then there was a moment that it started moving by itself. And we were like, okay, this is kind of strange. This is weird. Wow. So then this uh, same night, I had a nightmare that I, I believe it was the enemy telling me to play the game by itself. Like I didn't need anyone else to play with it. You can play with it by yourself. Yeah. And so then that dream, you know, made me think, you know, let me try playing it by myself. The next day I started playing it by myself in my room. I locked myself in the room and I started playing with it. And it became Cindy like an obsession. And I, I kept hearing no, uh, voices in my head telling me to play with it, telling me to spell out certain things. And it was like speaking to me in my head. Um, um, you know, my sister even told me that for a moment, like my eyes began to change. I became a different person. I became very obsessed. I became very fearful. Suddenly, the more I played with this game, the more fear creeped in. Uh, I never had anxiety ever before. I started having anxiety. I would say a few weeks after playing the game, I started to be tormented at night by demons. Um, there was one particular evening that I felt something come over my body and cover my nose and mouth and I couldn't breathe. And I said, and I started screaming and, and I just became so fearful. They began to intimidate me, torment me. I mean, I lived in complete fear. They were shaking my bed. There were footprints over my my bed. They were running around. They were opening and closing my closet door where I kept the game. Um, I could hear voices, see black shadows coming around. I mean, they just knew that they were they were tormenting me, and I, I was scared. Mm -hmm. And all I could do was just put my the, my covers over my head and just pray that it would go away. And so I began to tell my mom. 
I said, mom, I'm really scared. This is happening to me. I believe that my mom believed me, but I don't think she really did. Uh, you know, and I said, mom, what do I do? Can I sleep with you? And she said, mommy, if she would call me mamita in Spanish, she would say, mommy, if you're scared, then, then say, God help me. Jesus help me. Okay. Whenever you feel like that. Okay. And I said, you sure, mommy, it's going to work. You sure? Okay. Well, I don't know. And so I remember then another night when I kept playing with it and I went to bed, all of a sudden, again, I felt that, that pressure on my chest and I felt the hand go over again. I said, Jesus, help me. And then all of a sudden, it, it just, it went away. Like it got really quiet. And I said, oh my goodness. Wow. This worked. If I say Jesus, the name of Jesus worked. It, it made them go away. And so I started to connect this. I said, wow. Every time I felt like I was being uh, tormented, I said, Jesus, and it would go away. And I said, wow, this is so one, one, one day, um, I'm, as I'm playing the board, this board begins to speak to me and tell me to kill my mother, my father and my sister. And it tells me exactly how to do it. And then it told me to kill myself after and to come with us. And I said, oh, heck no. What is wrong with this board? And I started cursing at it. And my sister comes in. She's like, you, sister, she's like, Andrea, you've gone crazy. I'm going to tell mom and dad on you. You need to get rid of that game. You have changed so much. Your eyes are different. You're possessed. Something is wrong with you. You keep fighting with us. You keep fighting here. And, and I even felt it myself, but I, I was blind. And so what I did was I broke the board and I didn't tell my mom or my sister. And I went to the trash and I threw the board away. And I felt, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I think it's, it's over. It's over. You know, I, I started to connect. Maybe the board is what's causing all this fear, all this, uh, all this torment. And what happened was I went to school the next day. I want to go to school. I come back from school and this board is on my bed in one piece, Cindy. Some, someone, something put that board back in my room supernaturally. And right then and there, I started feeling like I was hallucinating. It want, they wanted me to become so crazy that I, it would kill me. And I was even having... Um, uh, suicidal thoughts at this moment, like, oh my God, this is, you know, like I wanted to die at this point. And because after this, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to burn this stuff. I'm going to burn it. I grabbed it. I grabbed the books and I burned it. I said, I, I felt, I knew that they were connected some way, somehow. And so I took the items, I burned it and I felt relieved. I felt, you know, once and for all, this is over. This is done. Well, that night by doing that, the, 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 the demons were so upset that I did that, that they mm. tormented me. They shook my bed. And again, I cried out, Jesus, help me. And all, all, again, it, everything cleared out. Every time I said Jesus, it would stop. And after that, you know, things, things begin to get bad around the house um, after I threw those items away. There were a lot of arguments in my house because I became very rebellious. Mm -hmm. I became disobedient. I started fighting with my sister. I started arguing back with my parents, which I never did before. I started skipping school. I started getting into drinking, smoking. I was introduced to a boy who became my boyfriend uh, at a very young age. And my parents found out about it and they said, honey, you are way too young to have a boyfriend. You cannot have a boyfriend at your age. So you have to cut that off. But I didn't, I didn't listen. And so my parents became very worried and my parents wanted the best for us. So they decided to move us out of that neighborhood, that house. And they said, you know, maybe if we move to a better area, maybe our, our my daughter might get her act together, you know? So um, we ended up moving but I still kept my relationship with this boyfriend. 
If you enjoy our content, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest releases. Turn on the notification bell. Have a story to tell? We'd love to hear it. Reach out to us at cindybingham.com or connect with us on Instagram. Now, back to the show. And I remember starting this school when it was maybe 30 minutes away from where we lived. And um, a, a few months go by and one of my friends from my old school calls me and tells me that my boyfriend had cheated on me, that she saw him with another girl. And I was devastated. You know, my first boyfriend, my heart was broken. I thought my world was over with. I was crying. I was depressed. And so I tried to get my mind off of it. And I remember hanging out with my girlfriends. We went to the mall. Um, then one particular evening, we were invited to a party with some of my friends. And we're at this party and everyone's drinking and, and people are passing around a blunt, a, 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 some weed. And, you know, we're, we're all smoking it, but this weed felt very different. I suddenly began to feel, um, very dizzy and I started to see my friends in like triples. I started seeing shadows. I started hearing my heartbeat really racing. I, I, and I felt like as I was hallucinating, like I was seeing things and, and, and I never have felt that before. And so what happened was I went to the bathroom and I put some water on me and I said, maybe it's something I ate. Maybe it's something. Could it be something in the weeds? I don't know what it is, but all of a sudden I'm, I'm feeling my heart racing. So, and you could see my, on my chest, like going boom, 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 boom. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm in my head, I'm praying, God, what is going on? I'm having this conversation with God, like, God, what is happening? As soon as I get out of the bathroom, I felt my heartbeat slow down, go boom, 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 boom. And I tell my friend, honey, I feel like I'm about to pass out. Like I'm like, I'm going to die before I even said that I dropped, I collapsed. I don't even know what happened. All I know is the next day I woke up, I was in the hospital. I had all sorts of like IVs on me and the doctor comes in and says, young lady, uh, you're one lucky girl to be alive. He said, uh, you overdosed last night. Did you know what was in, in that weed? I said, no, doctor. And he said, you know, there was high levels of PCP in it. And then PCP was very popular. They were lacing it. And I didn't know that this weed was, was laced. And it, it hit me. It almost killed me. And um, at that moment, I felt like I just wanted to die because mm. so many bad things begin to occur. And I felt like my, word, my world was shattered. Like I felt hopeless. I said, my mm. parents are going to find out. Oh, my gosh, this is another bad thing I'm doing. Uh, God, just take my life. Just please. Why did you even save me? You know, like mm. I have no purpose. I have no purpose. I'm being tormented by demons. I have anxiety. I have panic attacks. I overdosed on PCP. I'm drinking. I, I, this boyfriend just cheated on me. And I, you know, my world just ended and I'm crying there. And I remember getting home and I wanted to commit suicide. And I, and I, I thought, and I contemplated many, many times on how I would do it, but God saved me. But, and, and God was like, no, no daughter. And so many times like I wanted to drink just pills and just swallow them and just end my life. And I was just a battle of, the, uh, you know, the, the enemy uh, trying to take my life. It was one thing after another. And I really believe that it started with this board, this board game that I opened so many demonic doors. And so shortly after this, you know, I'm embarrassed to go to school because all the kids found out that I, that this happened to me and, you know, kids are, are mean, they, they you know, they, some of them just don't have any uh, empathy. Um, mm -hmm. And I started to get bullied because of it. 
and I didn't even want to go to school. And I remember um, coming from the bus, I um, saw my boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend from a distance, and he was very persistent, trying to um, ask me to uh, give him another chance. He was asking me, hey, Andrea, could you give me another chance? And I kept saying, no, no. But he was very persistent. He did this many times, and then I gave in. I gave him another chance and we worked it out, but he became, uh, I noticed, uh, very different after like a month or two, he started drinking, he started getting into drugs. He became verbally abusive over the phone. He said he was watching me. He became very possessive and it was scaring me. Um, and shortly after that, I found out that I was pregnant, you know, and I'm a teenager, very young. I didn't know what to do. I finally had to tell my parents. I told my parents they were not happy, but, you know, being Christians, my parents said, honey, you know, we are uh, going to help you raise this baby. You're going to have this baby and we're going to help you with this, this baby. Um, and I thank God for my parents to this day, Cindy, because of that, because if it wasn't for them, my goodness, you know, I don't know where I would be with the help that they provided After this, once my boyfriend found out that I was pregnant, I, um, he, he became physically abusive. The first time he ever hit me was at a birthday party. We were at a, a, at a birthday party. I was seven months pregnant. I'll never forget. And he confronted me about a, a girlfriend of mine that I was speaking to and he didn't like. And uh, he was outside. He was drunk. And out of nowhere, there's nobody outside. And out of nowhere, he just punches me in my face. And I remember I dropped to the ground and I said, my God, what is this? Like, what is happening here? You know, and, and then suddenly he begins to uh, 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 punch me more around my body. He begins to kick me. And, and I remember weeping and I remember crying. I went into the car and I said, please take me home. I got home. And Cindy, I had bruises all over my arms. I had bruises, a, a black eye around my eye. And I had to cover up these bruising with makeup to go to school. But you could still see my eyes because, you know, when you have a black eye, your eyes so small, you could still, you could see the purple. And um, I remember getting to school and people would ask me, oh my goodness, Andrea, are you okay? What happened to you? And, you know, I would have to lie. I had to tell them, you know, I fell, you know, no, everything's okay. Covering up for him time after time, you know, and um, I ended up having the baby and things weren't going so well for me with my parents at home. Um, we began to argue a lot. And so I ended up moving in with my boyfriend at the time. And I began to see my boyfriend sinking at that time in a hole, in a and an alcohol addiction, a drug addiction. He was drinking on a daily basis. He was smoking on a daily basis. And I remember one evening, I'm about to go to bed and I had the baby in the other room and I could hear him come up the stairs and um, I would play off like I was sleeping because I was scared of him. I was, sc I was scared what he would do to me uh, he didn't know what he was doing when he's drunk. So I played it off like I was sleeping. And so I closed my eyes and he comes in the room and he, I could hear him making all these noises, like opening drawers, like he's looking for something, looking in the closets, opening doors, really being really loud. And then suddenly I'm, I'm looking, I'm playing it off like I'm sleeping, but I'm really looking at him. I see him with a gun in his hand and, and then he comes over and he shakes me. He's like, Andrea, wake up. And he goes, he puts the gun on my head and he goes, Andrea, if you ever leave me, I'm going to kill you. He said, I'm going to kill you just like that. And I, and I began to pray in my head, I said, Lord, help me. And then I remember I got up, I went to the other room to protect the baby because he had a gun. I didn't know what he was going to do in the next room with it. So I locked myself in the other room and I began I held the baby and I began to call and I said, Lord, help me. Please get me out of this relationship or I'm going to die. Either it's going to be me, the baby, we're going to die, Lord. Please help me. God, save me. Take me out of this. 
And then shortly after this, I called my parents. I told them the situation. And um, they said, honey, we think that you need to put a restraining order. We went to the court. I put a restraining order on him. And um, several months went by. And we found out that he was getting his act together. I spoke to his mother. And he said, she said that he was going to church. He was going to seek help, AA meetings. And, you know, I was very happy for him. I said, wow, this is wonderful. Good. He's getting his act together. After this, he calls me and he says, hey, Andrea, you know, I just want to know if there's a possible way that we can co-parent, you know, and inside of me, of the goodness of my heart, you know, I, I wanted him to see the baby because it had, it's been, it was, it was a while. And at the same time, I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit telling me, don't daughter, don't do it. Don't. But I didn't listen and I gave in. And he said, you know, do you think maybe we can sit down and talk, maybe go out to eat and see how we can co-parent? I can see the baby um, here and there. And I said, you know, all right, that, that's fine. Let, we, we can do that. We'll, we'll talk about it, see what we can arrange. So he said, okay, I'll pick you up. So he picks me up and I get in his car. We're on our way. And I remember he took a different route. Um... And this specific road, it was very, it was a one way road and it was really dark. And all you could see was his headlights and like fields. And so then I began to feel fear for some reason. And I said, and, my, and I'm talking in my head, why am I feeling fear? Why am I feeling fear? And then all of a sudden I, I say, hey, where are you taking me? And then he didn't say anything. And I heard him shut the, the, the doors. I said again, where are you taking me? What's going on? And then all of a sudden he breaks, stops the car and he takes me in the middle of like a, a, a he's, we're in the middle of a, 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 like a deserted area and he just punches me out of nowhere. I'm knocked out cold. All I can remember is hearing him and I'm weak. I can't regain my consciousness. I got to try to get up or, or, you know, to fight back because he was bigger than me. Um, and then suddenly I could hear him come out of the car, come around, grab my body. He comes around, grabs me and pulls me, drags my body all the way down to the middle of the field. And I'm trying to regain my strength. And then in, in my head, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to die like this. God, help me. Please help me. God, save me, Lord. And then all of a sudden, he lays me right there and I can see him walk back to the car. And I'm just like, God, I don't want to die like this. I don't want to die like this. My Lord, help me, save me, God. Help me to regain my strength, Father. And then all of a sudden I see him turn on the headlights of his car, turns on the car and he, the car is coming at me. And all of a sudden I said, Jesus, help me. I remember also my dad, that Psalms 91 came to my head. It's like the Holy Spirit was reminding me Psalms 91, Psalms 91. And then I said it in my head and I started praying it. And I said, and I said, Jesus, help me. And all of a sudden I felt someone like got me out of the way. And it was three men out of nowhere. Cindy just came, grabbed my body. And moved me out of the way of the car. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I should have been dead, Cindy. I should have, mm. I should have died that night. Mm. But God mm -hmm. saved me. God had a plan for my life. Right. And I didn't know it. Mm. And after this, I remember... Um, the guys were there and they, they held him down mm. until the cops came. We called the, 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 the police. They came, they arrested him and he was in jail for a long time. We went through several court dates and I remember telling the judge, I said, your honor, if this man comes out, he's going to kill me. And he's done this many times. He, he, he's put guns to my head. He's abused me. He's left me bruises all over my body. He has threatened to kill me many times. He has hit me with his fists. He's hit me with his shoes. 
He's hit me with his hands. He's hit me with, with um, the iron um, hangers, belts, and the uh, the you know the judge looked at me like with fear and he, I, like i could see that he believed me and he said he just nodded his head and and then the sentence was one year in jail and he was deported after the year serving the year in jail he got deported back to his country after this Cindy, I am depressed. I have a lot of fear. I have a lot of anxiety after this situation. I'm very paranoid. I cannot sleep because I'm thinking that he's going to come after me. I'm thinking he's just going to come out of nowhere. I remember I would put the baby in the car seat in the back of the car. And every time I would put the baby, I would I, I would like take breaks to look back to see if he was coming around because I, I, I feared for my life. I thought that really maybe he might not be in jail. Maybe he's behind the bushes or something. And it, it's so sad to live a life like that. It was so sad. And I, I remember just every week I was calling the ambulance because I said, I'm having a heart attack. Yes. Help me, please. I'm about to die. I felt like I'm about to die, but it was panic attacks that I was having. It was, they got so bad that I felt like I was going to die. And they were like, honey, no, you're having a panic attack. It's not a heart attack. And I suffered with this for so long. I remember I used to, I, I lived in insomnia. I couldn't sleep. And after this, you know, I started school again and I worked a job to maintain my daughter, but it wasn't enough. You know, Cindy, uh, I was introduced to a girlfriend of mine who said, she said, Andrea, if you ever need any extra cash or any extra money, let me know. Um, you can come work with me. I said, all right. You know, and I thought about it and I was like, oh, you know, let me, let me call her. And I said, Hey girl, you know, I'm actually interested in making some extra money. Um, what is it that you do? And this is where I got introduced to the strip club industry. Um, she brought me and in one evening and I remember I get there and man, I said, there's no way that I can do this. <laughs> I said, do they have another position? Maybe a cocktail waitress position, a bartender? No, they're like, no, I'm sorry. We, we are in need of dancers. And I said, oh my goodness. If I started thinking all these thoughts, what if my parents find out? What if my friends find out? Everyone's going to find out. Oh my gosh, what are they going to think of you? And at that point, you know, you're in the world and you begin to take shots. And I had a few shots that evening and I just became bold. And I went up and it became an addiction after that because you see how much money you can make in one evening that you're just like, this, what I can make in one evening is what I'm making every two weeks. It, you know what I mean? So this became, and you became like almost like powerful. You be, you felt like, uh, like this power over you, you know? And, um, I saw a lot of dark things there though, with the girls, just saw a lot of girls that, that grew up with no parents, grew up with no father, had a lot of daddy issues, uh, addictions, girls that were just doing it for the money um, so they can feed their addictions. Um, many of the girls too were much older and that's all they felt that that, that, that was their life. They, had, they felt like they had no purpose, no hope. Um, some of them were smart. Some of them I, I did meet that were in school. They were paying off their school. They would save and leave. And I was like, God, that's what I want to do. I just want to save and leave. I don't want to stay here forever. And you know, for a moment, some of these customers, you have to build customers to make money. And so I started building uh, customers and most of them were older men. And you know, some of these men wanted to just hear you. He wanted you to hear them. And I, I, you, I begin to feel sorry for them. You know, because you, you have to play a certain role. You, you got to hustle. You, you know what I mean? You're there to make money. You're there to get their money. And um, for a moment, I started feeling a conviction. And that was the first time I ever felt that. 
And I'm like, what is happening here? You know, um, when usually I got to hustle for the money and I started feeling love for them. Uh, like I, I wanted to hear out their problems. And even the married men that would come there and say and, and pour out their heart, how they were having troubles with their 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 wives at home and, and this and that. And when, when in reality, I shouldn't be giving them advice. I should be, you know, taking their money. <laughs> and I started to feel sympathy. And I was like, this is not for me. A lot of things that I saw there, um, it was very dark. You could feel the demonic presence in those places that that people carried a lot of lust, a lot of uh, drug addictions, pornography, um, sex addiction, um, you know, it's, uh, spirits of fear, of anxiety. I mean, it, it was it was dark. It was dark. And, you know, many of the times I would have to um, take drugs to to stay um, awake because you're working doubles and you're tired and it takes such a toll on your body, you know? And so one particular evening we are, uh, we go out and we're drinking and on the way home, I get pulled over by the cops. And at, at this point I'm in pretty intoxicated and I get charged with DUI and second degree assault because they said that I was aggressive. Of course, when you're intoxicated, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> And I remember I, you know, I was a mess. I, I, I was crying and I was in the back of the police car and I started crying. And then I remember having this conversation with God. Maybe the officers thought I was going crazy, but I started, why God is my life so bad? Why is this all happening to me? And then I heard a voice say, daughter, I've been trying to get your attention. And I was like, you know, but you've been fighting me. And I'm like, oh my God, what is happening here? Father, I'm ready. God, help me. You know, it, it, it's so crazy because when we're in our lowest is when we call on God. And it shouldn't be like that. And then I remember I, I get to the um, uh, jail cell. I'm put in the jail cell by myself and it's freezing and it, it, the concrete and it was a concrete floor and that didn't help. And I, I was put in the concrete floor and I, I sat down. I remember I hunched over and I was like this and I was just weeping. I was like, God, help me, Lord. Get me out of this life. Get me out of this lifestyle. I don't know what to do and I don't know how to get out of it. I don't know. God, I feel like something is controlling me. I feel cursed. I feel like... I, I, like something's controlling me. God, help me. And then suddenly, as I look up, I'm supernaturally sober. And I look around and I'm like, oh my gosh, how this is crazy. How can I just suddenly I'm drunk and then I'm supernaturally sober? And I started weeping even more. I started weeping. And as I'm weeping, I begin to feel the presence of God. I begin to feel the Holy Spirit, like a tangible, like a shh, like an electricity over me, running like waves and like winds blowing over me. And I begin to weep uncontrollably. And I begin to say, Father, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for the life that I'm living. God, help me. I don't know how to get out of this life. I don't know how to do it. I can't do it with my own strength. How are you going to help me? How are you going to help a wretch like me? I'm already so lost. Can you help me? And I believe by having the humility to say that, I believe that God can work with that. God's like, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Are you ready? Because I'm ready. And I felt it. I said, I'm ready, Lord. I will surrender my life to you. I will surrender what that lifestyle that I'm living to you, God, if you can help me, because I can't help myself. I'm hopeless. I have no purpose. I feel like my life is, is over. I need to set an example for my daughter, Lord, my family. God, help me. And then I remember getting out of the jail. My mom bailed me out. And I get home. And a week later, I'm talking to this boy already, who is my husband today. And his mother, who is my mother-in-law today, she says to my husband, uh, uh, you know, well, my boyfriend then, um, tell Andrea there is a retreat 
a women's retreat that I would like to invite her to. And he told me that, and I couldn't believe it. I said, my God, God hurt me in the jail cell to surrender and to help me. And he wants me to go to this. Yes. Tell your mommy. Yes. I want to go. I want to go. And Cindy, I was so excited to go. I could not wait for a brand new start, a brand new life, a change in my life. And I remember packing up my bags and I remember asking his mom, so what do I take? And, and I, I, I didn't know anyone from the church. I'd never been to her church before. And so I remember I went and, and it was all young girls and I get there. And the first night it was this powerful worship. And I'll never forget what I felt in the jail cells, what I felt during the worship. It was a presence, a thick presence of God. The Shekinah glory was there and I wept and I felt prostrate before the Lord and I humbled myself and I said, God, deliver me, help me, save me, Lord. Do what you have to do. Purge everything, every unclean thing out of me, God. Do what you have to do. Mold me, use me, do whatever you want, God. I'm here. I'm here, Lord. Save me, God. And by doing that, by just saying that, I was delivered that night from so many demonic th th doors, things that I had allowed in my life for so many years. And I remember, Cindy, you know, and I'm not ashamed to say this, but I threw up. I was throwing up. Yeah. I was throwing up so many things that were just coming out of me. And I remember for the first time I felt peace. Amen. I've never experienced peace like that. So many years that I lived with anxiety, I couldn't sleep. I remember that evening, I slept like a baby. It was the sweetest sleep, so sweet. Sleep that I experience now today because I know what torment felt like, being tormented by demons, being attacked by demons. Fear felt like I know what anxiety feels like. I know what panic attacks felt like, but this was so different. This is the presence of God. And I'm like, I've been waiting for this all my life. This was what I've been waiting for. That out there was nothing. It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't bring you joy. It's temporary. That is not real joy. Joy is in the presence of the Lord. This is plan for us. This is mighty plan for us it's his presence it's him our creator who created us and that that weekend was the best weekend of my life I remember I got home and I was just I was in awe amazed of what God was doing in my life and um that is that is my testimony Cindy oh my goodness I was getting this emotional you, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold my tears here. Oh my goodness. Um, wow, what a powerful, powerful, powerful testimony. And Amen. to see where God took you from. Um, yes. From the, streets, from the streets of. Oh my God. Yeah. From the lowest. <laughs> From the club, right? From the yep. podium of the club. Yeah. To a worship leader. Amen. Yes. yes and a vocal coach. Only God can do this. Only God. Only God can do that. Woo! Only oh. God can do that. Oh my goodness. Only He. And for anyone <laughs> tuning in um, who may be experiencing similar struggles to what you you went through um, perhaps they've been introduced to witchcraft or, or maybe they're battling with demonic torment or struggling with substance abuse or facing violence and they may feel like there's no hope this is it um i have no future Nothing can happen for me. What words of encouragement would you offer someone struggling with feelings of hopelessness? Yes. While dealing with those situations. 
Yes, first and foremost, stay away from witchcraft, stay away from these things because they bring a lot of torment. They bring anxiety, mm -hmm. they bring panic attacks. They bring many, many uh, uh, open doors to your life that allows the enemy to control you. So be very careful um, because the enemy came only to steal, kill and destroy. And he does not, he wants to destroy you because he knows that you have a plan that God made you in his and he has created you to um, worship him, to serve him. He has mighty plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. Each and every one of us are made so creatively, so uh, differently, unique um, in, in ways that he can use us to spread the gospel. You know, and I, I believe that each and every one of us have a gift. Yes. I was, I was, I was one of them that I said, Lord, I, I feel hopeless. I'm nobody. I'm a nobody. I'm no, who am I Lord for you? What have you created me to be? Reveal it to me. So I, so I surrendered my will for his. And I said, Lord, reveal to me your perfect will for my life. God gives us free will to do whatever we want to. What a gentleman to respect what we want to do. So he says, okay, that's fine. But I have a better plan for you. And so I said that I want his perfect plan. Lord, reveal it to me. And because I did this, and if you do this, he's going to show you the perfect plan for your life. He does have plans to, to prosper you, to, to feel hope, to, to, for you to inspire others and encourage others um, through his word, just to use you in so many different ways. You know, people, <clears throat> so many people have different gifts, right? And everyone has gifts. Everybody does, but it's to be used for God's glory, for good, for him. Um, so, you don't have to feel hopeless because God is with you. He has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power yes. and a sound mind. Come on. Right. He is right. He is Jehovah and yeah, yeah. he is there to, to help you to reveal your destiny. He has predestined yes. you before the foundations of the earth. Okay. Right. And let me tell you, it, this is just the beginning for you. This is just the beginning. So open your heart. The first thing is admitting that God, it, 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 Jesus is the son of God, repenting of your sins, coming before God and having the humility and say, Lord, help me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. I believe, Lord, that you died and you rose again after the third day, Lord. And I know that you are alive today, God. Help me. And fill me with your Holy Spirit and he will. And he will do it and he will fulfill all that he has for you. And you yes. tell him, Lord, here is my, here I surrender my will for yours. Reveal it to me, Lord. What is it? And he is going to. So there's no need to feel hopeless because God is with you. Yes, we do go through trials and tribulations in this in this life. Unfortunately, they are promised, but it's only to make us stronger and to depend on God because mm -hmm. he is the only way. He is the only one that can help us. That is Woo! my powerful. What a powerful woman of encouragement, woman of God. Um, Amen. How would you describe your personal relationship with Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Jesus. Jesus is my best friend, Cindy. Oh. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my defender. Jesus is my counselor. He's my oh. teacher. He's my rock. He's the one I cry out to. He's the one that, that gives me all that I need. He's my provider. He yes. is everything in one. He is everything we need is Jesus. That's, that's who Jesus is to me. The love of Ooh. my life, the love of my life. Oof. I, I love boasting and bragging about the Lord. Man, it's, it's just so good. When you taste and see his goodness, oh my goodness. My
He's just so good. Yes. Yes. Taste and Ooh. see his goodness because he's so good. He's so good. <laughs> uh, the, I, I feel the anointing in this place. I mean, oh. I'm, uh, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Right. My <laughs> last question. Um, what do you hope listeners, uh, listeners take away from your testimony today? Yes. So today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow mm. is not promised. Don't delay. Don't make the mistakes I made. Don't wait. Because tomorrow again is not promised. We don't know when our last day on earth will be. And we need mm. to prepare for eternity. And my testimony is to show the power of God of how mm. he's still in the saving business. God is more alive than never. That if you call on the name of Jesus, he will come and save you. You can call on any other name. And I promise you that that name is not going to save you. But the name of Jesus has power, has power to break chains, has power to deliver you, has power to save you, has power to free you, has power to break chains, and has the power to, to do everything in your life that needs to be done. Only Jesus can do that. So that is... That is, that is my advice city. Wow. Yes. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Wow, what a powerful moment, you know, of just being in his presence. There's nothing like being in the presence of God. Amen. And woman, God, I just want to thank you for being here. Oh. Thank you for sharing your powerful testimony. Um, because... I know many people will be touched. Amen. Know? Somebody need to hear this. Yes. You know? And you know, I know you 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 know you've shared the, your testimony so many times, but God is doing something. You know, God is doing something, and somebody's gonna come across your testimony through Amen. the podcast, and will be blessed. Will be saved. Amen. How many lives? You don't even know how many lives you're saving through your testimony. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you, you. Cindy, for having me. It's such an honor. Thank you for having me, for believing in my testimony. Thank you so much.